So nice to be with you on the Brattlecast. We've got uh, almost 200 episodes out there now, and it's just getting to be more fun every time. I never know what this man, Ken Gloss, is going to bring into the studio here with me, Jordan Rich, but it's always interesting fun, whether it's music or sports or history or politics. And I think it's a, a combination of history, politics, and folklore today because, Ken, you wanted to talk about a famous Bostonian. Well, uh, also, too, let me just say I sometimes never know what I'm going to bring until the morning I decide to come. Some things I say, well, we've got to do this. But then sometimes I have like six, seven things lined up, and it's I get to work at 5.36 in the morning, and it's I'm going to go into the studio and – I uh, I say okay. Th- this is the one I'm going to bring. Makes life interesting. So uh, the the person in question is, is famous, maybe infamous, and his name is James Michael Curley. Well, I usually don't put a lot of politics into this thing or into my business. I try to stay neutral, but um, we have a whole load of things about James Michael Curley, who ran for elective office when he was in jail, under indictment and all that. And I kept keep hearing about, can you run when you're being indicted? Can you run when you've committed crimes? Uh, you, can pro- one, you can <laughs> run and win. <laughs> and so that's what brought this whole one up. Okay. But, but these are things that I've had for a while. And Curley was mayor, governor of Massachusetts. He was elected a few times when he was in jail. Uh, and uh, he was a character, to what, say the least. What way. was it that, that put him in behind bars? Was it well, mail fraud or something? Well, mail fraud. Also, he took civil service exams for some of his uh, some of his uh, citizens yes. in his town uh, and so on. Uh, and, and part of it – and that was probably the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Uh, but he also was a character, and he was a man who – really came out for the Irish in Boston, and the Irish were downtrodden. And what happened is you had the the old Yankee establishment. The thing is the Irish, with the influx of people and immigrants, all of a sudden were a majority, and he got elected. But uh, – and, and he knew my father, and he'd always call up and get books – from my father, but I've over the years run into a few collections. Now, one collection I ran into was I got a whole bunch of old recording records from WMEX Radio mm. in Boston, and then I had the records transferred to tape because a track was what was there at the time. Now, wait a minute, you're holding up what's known kids as a cassette, a cassette tape. <laughs> but I, I have about fifteen of these of speeches and. Uh, of in interviews with James Michael wow. Curley, and it's fascinating. You can see from his speech and how his voice was, how he could just pull people in. Mm-hmm. The interesting part about it, though, this was during the McCarthy era, a lot of these, mm-hmm. and what he was saying, you're pulled in by his voice and his diction and the way he's talking. And then when you really listen to what he's saying, you go, oh, because he was very much into the Red Scare and the communists and so on. Mm. But then he then he ended up in jail. And another collection I ended up buying probably a few years ago, well, more than a few years ago now, is uh, after Curley died, uh, some of his family had issues. Yes. And uh, his son, one of his sons came in over the period and sold us a number of his letters. And... We have a whole group of letters here from Curley when he was in Danbury Prison. and uh, That's in Con- Connecticut. That's right, in right. Connecticut. It's a federal prison, not a state prison, obviously. And uh, it's just sort of fascinating to read through. These are the official letters that we had him typed out, but we have the original handwriting all in Curley's uh, time. And, and in, there are some quotes that he had. Um, he he. Um, there was one that – there was another letter that I didn't bring when he was offered the ambassadorship to Poland mm-hmm. by Franklin Roosevelt. And uh, he was outraged. He ended up not – he supported Roosevelt, but then he felt Roosevelt then went against him. <laughs> he was outraged. He felt that he should have been the ambassador to the 
Vatican, which is what he wanted. In Poland, he said this was in 1932 or three. He said Germany on one side, Russia on the other. You should send your worst Republican enemy to Poland. He says, matter of fact, if you think it's so important there, why don't you quit and go there yourself? And how ironic that a future mayor of the city of Boston did become the, the ambassador, ambassador to the Vatican. But Ray uh, Flynn. then also there is uh, one of the uh, letters that he has. Um, I have about 10 of them in front of me. And he had just gotten into prison and he's writing to his wife. And he says, many of the four-legged creatures in my cell have more honor than the two-legged creatures in Washington. <laughs> so, so it goes on. I, I just pulled one out here. And um, it was saying, I, I am enclosing a clippings about another uh, uh, a victim of FDR whose only crime was that he refused to make a football of the Supreme Court. So just Curly is ranting and... Now, I, I know this uh, pretty much that it was the last hurrah, right, that was written about him. The last hurrah is a fabulous novel. Yeah, if you and want, a pretty good movie too with Spencer Tracy. Yeah, if the last hurrah was a, a novel by O'Connor mm -hmm. uh, about uh, fictionalized uh, James Michael Curley. And um, it, it's one of the best political novels and particularly... If you know Boston, I'd say the other one that I think rates up with it is the, All the King's Men, yeah. which was Huey Long in Louisiana. Right. But they, they, they both, in many ways, you wouldn't want them to be your politicians now. But they were both such engaging characters and such characters that, that you know, you see how they got elected. And then, of course, what was going on behind the scenes is – Everybody was getting paid off and sure. doing this and that. But they were so charismatic and people it's, loved them. They were so charismatic and people loved them as long as you were on their side. <laughs> uh, matter of fact, there, there's one thing that uh, I always love that uh, I'm pretty sure that Curly was the one who did this, is if you walk in Boston and you walk along Commonwealth Ave, there's a mall. And every block... There's a statue. Sure, I've done it, it many times. It starts off with Alexander Hamilton. Then there's General Glover, who was in the Revolutionary War and ran the Navy. There was William Lloyd ha uh, Garrison, who was the yeah, great abolitionist. abolitionist. And then you come to a block where you have uh, Patrick O'Brien, who was the first Irish mayor of Boston. Now, you, what you have to realize is when that statue was put up, that was in the heart <laughs> of the old Yankee area who would have been the last people in the world to vote for someone who was Irish. And that was statue, I am sure, was put there as a raise your fi middle finger to the whole Yankee establishment. Absolutely. And I remember as a younger guy uh, driving on the Jamaica Way and you could see his house, James Michael Curley's yeah. house, where his – Son then lived uh, afterwards, and it was a gorgeous house right there on the Jamaica Way. And, and the nice thing about that house is you could always tell it was that house because every shutter had a shamrock. Yeah. <laughs> there, there, there was a cut shamrock overlooking Jamaica Pond. Yes. But uh, I actually got called into that house once, uh, long, long after. Now, there was a big controversy that the desk, the mayor's desk got stolen out of there. When I went in, there was no desk, but who knows? But uh, what he did have is the library, and they were talking about selling the house or not selling it. And they wanted me to look at the books, and uh, there was there was some interesting books and so on that I, I'm pretty sure went to the library. Uh, but these letters, I'm eventually going to donate to May the bot. Yeah, the what you're seeing for this is for the radio yes, audience right. or the podcast. You're seeing the type, but if you flip it over, you'll see the handwriting I of see. each one because it's easy. It was easier to have them all transcribed. And wow! It's when you get into this history, it's just fascinating. And when you see what was going on, and here's a man writing to his family, and he misses this. He's writing to his daughter in many cases, but here's one of the more prominent 20th century politicians in in the Boston area. And uh, he was sitting in Danbury Prison, and he was not happy at all about uh, being in prison. 
He was not happy with anyone in Washington and Roosevelt. And I think he finally got a pardon from Truman eventually. His writing is really formal and very poetic, as is, was his His speech. speech. And, his t- and uh, it, it's always interesting when you bring in letters of historical note and you see the handwriting. It's, it's almost a, a, a spirit of that person is there in oh, the room with you. Absolutely. And, and to some degree, I imagine that the uh, prison authorities had to be able to read it too. They, because yeah, they, probably before they, send they have it to out. scan it before they send it out. Right? And, and again, anytime you're dealing with letters of people, you know, you sort of, I'll open this up just to touch touch the letter, and mm. James Michael Curley sat down with this, or or whatever famous person wrote it. Now, another time I'm going to come in, and I think I'll do this probably assuming we're going to be doing this for a while, I also have a whole long speech called How to Spend Campaign Funds. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll deal with that one and another. And, and when you laugh, it... it, it, it it's pr- he wrote it a little bit sarcastically, although I'm sure everything he said in that is true. We, we do miss, as as difficult as it is to know there's corruption at that level, but you you do miss that sparkling wit that is present in a guy like that, or even dare I say in the uh, in the old New York gangs of you know running Tammany Hall. I mean, they were sparkling characters. Well, of course, one of the things they did, and they did very well, and. You can probably get um, very detailed of why things didn't go well because of the corruption or the who got the jobs or who didn't. He was definitely one who separated out uh, the different races mm-hmm. and, and so on. Uh, but what you really get is his main thing was get jobs for my constituents, get them working, get them out of the poverty. And a lot of people, and this is always probably going to be true, that if you do can do something for them, they'll vote for you. You, especially as a Boston mayor, you know that's, that's uh, yeah. A, but it's it was a, Boston, Chicago, and he was governor too, which he says was a governor. lot for his popularity and his ability to make uh, uh, although make friends. One of the one of the things though that really happened when he was filled in for as mayor, uh, when he was in prison, he got out of prison. And his first comment was, now we can run the city right. His, the person filling in, Hines, did a perfectly good job. <laughs> and he got so upset of Curley sort of downgrading mm-hmm. him that he ran against Curley and won. And that's the well, Hines Auditorium. Uh, the Hines so- Auditorium, yeah. yeah. And you're, you're right. He was the father of a very celebrated, now passed on, uh, newsman, Jack Hines. Right. But you could see that Curley, even getting out of jail, had that arrogance that I'm the man, and every once in a while that backfires on you. Every once in a All while. All he had to do was say, thank you, you did a great job. <laughs> well, it sounds like other people in politics these days. <laughs> As Ken uh, does on a regular basis, uh, he entertains, he amuses, and he informs, and that's what the store is all about, too. And if you've never been to the Brattle Bookshop, it's on West Street in Boston, 9 West Street. Um, do make it a point when you visit the city. Go to brattlebookshop.com. Ken, we'll see you next time. Good luck in your election. Uh, no, I don't. I No, no, no. No running for office for this guy. You know, one thing I will say about elections is those politicians, whether you agree, disagree, it's an incredibly difficult job. Long, I'd rather work 12 hours at a bookstore than have any way have to go to a lot of the events they have. Amen to, to that. We'll see you next time on the Brattlecast.